Hello there and welcome to another Bow Beats review. Today we are taking a look at the Analog Rhythm Mark II from the Swedish company Electron. Now I have previously reviewed Analog 4 Mark II and if you want to check that out you can go to the link in the description. In this review I will go over four different things. Firstly, what is the Analog Rhythm Mark II? Secondly, what are the new features? Thirdly, a comparison with the Digitac and the Octatrack and fourth, give my first impressions and talk a little bit about whether or not this device is worth the money because it is quite an expensive device. So if you're new to the analog rhythm, what is it? Well, it's an 8 voice, 12 track drum machine slash sampler sample player. It means that you have 8 voices, 8 individual sounds that can be outputted at one time, but you have them spread out over the 12 tracks. You also have an FX track over here. Basically works just like a normal sequencer track, but instead of sequencing note data for the sounds, you're basically sequencing changes to the delay, the reverb, the di master distortion, the master compressor and the LFO. The LFO here on the FX track can be used to modulate the different settings for um, the effects, basically. And of course, all these different sounds that you have on the pads here, the 12 sounds, can be uh, very different in character. So the analog sound engine on the analog rhythm is quite different from something like the drum brute. Basically what you have is that each track here is associated with what is called a machine. So when track one here says bass drum, a kick drum, you can change it out to different sounding machines. These machines in turn have very different sound characteristics. Now, of course, having like a totally open analog circuitry where you could tweak away indefinitely like on the say analog 4 mark 2 would perhaps you know give you more versatility but having these machines makes it so that it's very quick and easy to change out the sound so for example here i have this kick here i select track number one i go into source and i can just scroll through the different kick machines And on track number one, I also have snare drums available. And a noise generator and an impulse generator. And the noise generator and impulse generator, I think is available on most of the tracks. Now, of course, this layout means that not every track can have the same machines. So for example, on the bottom row here, you basically have the, the kick drum and snare drum section and then you have the snare, rim shot and clap section over here and in the middle here you have the tom section so you have two different machines that are designed to create tom sounds and up here you have a bunch of different hi-hats and cymbal and cowbell type sounds. So besides sounding different, each machine also have different settings. As you can see when I scroll through here, you can see that the settings change depending on what machine is being loaded. And these settings, of course, have a huge impact on how you shape the sound. So for each bass drum machine that you can load, you have different settings. And that really makes it so that you can quickly create quite different type of drum sounds. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Now you can use these drum sounds, these machines to create more traditional sounding synth sounds, but it's of course not as versatile as something like the Analog 4 Mark II. But you can create some fun stuff, so let me show you a little demo of that, it's just something I whipped up. So here we have a, just one sound that is parameter locked to create both this kind of kick and this kind of bass sound. Now, like I talked about earlier, each track can hold a sample. A sample can be loaded via USB or you can sample it into the unit. This is new for the Mark II. Now, let me address a question that always comes up. Can you time stretch? And the answer is no. You can pitch samples. You can set start and you can set end and you can set loop, but you can't time stretch. That is a feature that is only available on the Electron Octa track, if you want to stick with the Electron brand, that is. Now let's talk a little bit about the sequencer. You access it by selecting a track, pressing the record, and you can see that these light up. These red ones here are active steps. They transmit a, a note value. Now what you can do on Electron is that you can parameter lock. And of course, if you're not new to Electron products, you know this. Basically what you have is you press a step, and you can go into whatever menu you want here and parameter lock a change. And you can see that it's parameter locked by the kind of white background on the actual value. So if I change something here, say the filter frequency, you can see that it changes to a white background. That means that the step is parameter locked. Now, what you can do on the analog rhythm that kind of sets it apart from other drum machines is that you can not only mix between the analog circuitry and and I can't pronounce the circuit, circuitry, analog circuitry. Somebody can leave a comment down below how I pronounce that. But anyway, you can change between this analog sound and the sample. And the way you can use this is that you can, of course, parameter lock it so that you have, for example, on number one here, you have the analog kick drum. And on step number three here, you have a sample playing, say a bass sample, a synth sample. That way you can use one track to create much more detailed and complex electronic music and electronic sounds than you could on, on pretty much any other sequencer with these step parameter changes. So let me show you that in a little demo. This is some minimalistic stuff that I just recorded yesterday, but I wanted to show you that with just one track, you can create a pretty complex soundscape. And of course, there are, are plenty of demos out there showcasing this. So this is just a brief little demo overview. And as you can see, this is just one track playing here. All the other tracks are muted. Just one track with parameter locked synth sounds, parameter locked samples. And something that sets this drum machine as, apart as well for, from other drum machines is the pretty extensive effects section. So for samples, you have bit reduction. For the entire track, you have under amp here, you have overdrive as well, which changes up the character. And you also have delay and uh, reverb here, delay and reverb. And you have distortion, which is a master effect. So it impacts pretty much all the tracks. You can set it up differently, so you can just have a couple of tracks going into the effects, but anyway. And you also have a master compressor, and there are also different settings for how the master effects come into play, how they affect the delay and reverb and so on, but I won't go into that deep a detail in this review.
about the stuff that some of you guys are here for, the new features. I've already touched on some of it and showcased some of it, but let's get into a little bit more detail. So let's start off with the pads. One big critique of the analog Rytm Mark I was the pads. People thought they were small, very stiff, a little bit unresponsive. And for me personally, it did hurt my hands playing them over a long period of time because I have small, gentle and, and soft hands. And they, you know, hitting them repeatedly, you know, made my hands hurt because they were quite stiff. So I'm glad to report that the new pads, while they are more stiff and not as responsive as say the Machina Mark III pads, they are a lot better than the Mark I pads. And for me, using them over a long period of time doesn't hurt my hands as much. So the pads are larger and I do feel that they are more responsive. I find it easier to record notes at different velocities and they respond better and more reliably to pressure when I use them. So these are big improvements from the Mark I. Now let me segue from talking about the pads to how the pads are used. Now on the Rhythm you can use them in a number of different ways. You can use them in the play mode to obviously play stuff. Oh, the excellent finger drumming, mm, my skills. <laughs> you can use them in mute mode to mute tracks. And you can use them in chromatic mode to play something chromatically. And you can use them for scenes and performances. Scenes and performances are very interesting. And, and here's where sort of an improvement has been made to the Mark II. But let me first talk a bit about what are the scenes and the performances. Scenes basically functions like an on and off switch for parameter changes for one or more tracks. These are not tied to steps, but are global. So it's different from say parameter locking a step. So basically you switch it on or rather you switch it, switch it on and you switch it off. And it can sound something like this. Now performance macros are similar, but instead of being on and off, it's more like turning a knob. And you can see here we have a quick performance macro knob here as well. So yeah, it kind of ties into it. So basically what you do is that you set how much you want a certain parameter to increase or decrease. And when you push the button, the more you push the button, the harder you push it, the longer you push it, the more of an increase you'll get. So let me show you how that can sound. Basically, scenes here are better for large, quick changes. For example, changing tuning. Say you, you want to pitch shift an entire pattern, for example. You can do that with a scene. You don't want that to happen gradually. And, and with a performance, it's better for these kind of filter sweeps. Or say you want to make it like a transition effect where you... Um, where you kind of, uh, how do you say, low cut, low cut a lot of stuff and add um, effects to it. That's where I would use uh, like a performance macro instead. And while we're at it, let's talk about the new additional buttons. You just saw me using the new performance knob here. And the new performance knob here works basically like on the Analog 4 Mark II as well. You press the Q per button here, it's a new button and a new knob. And you're instantly in the performance scene, or well, performance select here. And you can select whatever performance macro you want. So let's select number one here. And when you turn this, you will, of course, increase um, the effect of the performance and I, I really love this addition because one it's much easier to use a performance macro with a knob with a dedica de dedicated knob rather than having to press the pad it's much more how do you say it's much much more precise using the knob now secondly and what you saw in my little demo is that with with this new addition means that you can access a scene on and off while you're tweaking the performance macro in a, in a super flexible and, and very playable way. And I thought that was brilliant, the way you could have those two effects interact. 
So for example, you know, like you heard me play here on this beat here. When I add the scene here, I just high pass a lot of stuff and I add more reverb. And when I turn the knob, I add distortion. So it becomes this kind of rhythmic, rhythmic breakdown. And of course you have the sampling button here. We'll get into that in a second. You also have the fill over here. Uh, the chain and song are actually not new per se. They're different buttons, they're moved, but you had those on the Mark One as well. You also have the fix button over here, which is really handy. It fixed the velocities. If you use the function and fix here, you can set how at what velocity you want it to be fixed. And then you just go out of the menu and you can you know, press it. And there's also the addition of new bank buttons over here. So you have quicker access to the banks and they also have secondary functions that were previously harder to access. So here, for example, on the top row, you have quick access to different settings for the patterns. And the temporary jump is really interesting because when you are playing a pattern like this and you enable it, it means that when you hold another pattern, it goes to that pattern and when you release the pattern, it goes back to the previous pattern. So I thought that was really cool. And that is of course very useful for live performances and whatnot. So yeah, that's something to, to check out maybe in a future video or something like that. staring at us is the screen the screen is really nice it's a lot better than the mark one screen easier to read at an angle and to me it's identical to the analog 4 mark 2 screens now i don't think it's as good as the screen on the dig attack i'm not sure if it's the colors or it's the, the size difference i just feel that the screen on the dig attack is more current it's, it's more appealing. And you know what? I would love to have seen some of the additions to the Digitac to carry over to the Analog Rhythm Mark II and the Analog 4 Mark II. For example, when we're in the amp and filter, I would love to see more of a, uh, more of a graphical representation of uh, the attack, hold, decay, and so on, as, as well as for the filter, that kind of graphical representation that you have on the Digitac. So that's something, Electron, that I would love to see in an update. I'm not sure if it's doable, but yeah. Oh, and another thing I really miss is the ability to see the sample, the shape of the sample. You can see that when you sample, but you can't see it after the fact when you've recorded something. And that's something I would love to be able to see like on the Digitact. So here we have a side-by-side -side comparison, the Mark I and the Mark II. Now both are powered up and you can see the screens, for example, are quite different. You can see at an angle, I'm recording this at a slight angle, and the lighting is pretty similar from, from both sides. So the Mark II screen is much more readable, is larger, more readable. The Mark II, Mark I screen here is, is harder to read at an angle, definitely. And you can also note differences in size here on the pads. If I put my little pointer fingers here, you'll note that there's a large size difference. Now let's talk sampling. For all intents and purposes, the sampling on the Analog Rit Mark II is very similar to the Digitact options. You don't have time stretch, you sample mono, and if we look here, if we press the direct button here, you can see that we have 33 seconds of memory available to, to sample a certain length. I'm not entirely sure how large a file you can load into algorithm you might have to look that up specifically but anyway it's very similar to how it works on the digitact so here I have the trusted pocket operator um, let's see here and let's go into audio inputs 
And to sample, you press the sampling button here. You have to pick a source, so you do that with the G button here. So let's put let's try left here, I think maybe. Let's yeah, we got some sound going. You can see a little sound meter here going on, moving. Uh, so we know sounds coming, and we can press the monitor button here as well. So to record, I press function and yes to do a manual record. And I press yes again to stop. Now it's normalized. I use the A button here to scroll into the waveform here and to find the starting point. And since you have these two different lanes here, a zoomed in one and a, a more zoomed out version, it's very easy to find the start and end points. So let's just uh, trim it by pressing yes. Now we print, trimmed the start point. And we can trim the end point as well. And we use the C button here, C knob here to trim the end point. Press yes. And we have the sample. Now we press yes again. And we call it just, let's call it something. Let's call it um, PO32. PO, no, PO20 actually. And now it's saved. Now let's assign it to a pad. Let's assign it to pad number five. Done. And now we can sequence it. We can add some, some effects to it, add some reverb and delay. And we can also do a little bit of a, a parameter lock here. So let's see here, let's, let's do something with it. Let's parameter lock away here. And I'll turn down the track volume a bit as well. Maybe I'll turn, turn down the sample volume a bit. So let's see here. There's one difference between the digitech and the rhythm with what you can do with the sample, and that's the looping feature. So on the rhythm here, you have the looping on and off. So you can use a very short waveform to create, say, a synth sound, but you can't set um, a loop point like you could on the digitech. And this will actually impact uh, the way you create sounds on this unit. It's not a major thing. I don't think really that that, that everyone will notice and will care. But for me, when I do like more experimental stuff, I really enjoyed having that option on the Digitact, but it's not available at the moment on the Rhythm. Now it's also good to note that the audio in here and external in here are both stereo inputs, but the sampling, the sampling that takes place turns the file into a mono file. The playback is mono all the way. But when you add, for example, the reverb here, the reverb is stereo, as you can hear here. The it's a stereo reverb, it's a stereo delay, so you do you have the option to add the width to the sound. Now let's talk a little bit about the I.O. So the I.O. is quite different from the Mark 1. You still have the MIDI in, MIDI out, the through, but you now have the control inputs and you have individual outputs for all the sounds as well as the sampling input. So basically you have four inputs for sound and then you also have the individual outputs that are no longer um, shared. So basically you have all the eight voices on individual mono outputs. That's super handy. You don't need to use a, a splitter cable. And you also have the control inputs here that you use for expression pedal or CV. These are very similar to how it works on the Analog 4 Mark II. If you want to see a tutorial on how to use the control inputs, I'll leave a link in the description because it's basically the same for the Analog Rhythm Mark II as for the Analog 4 Mark II. But basically when you use the control inputs, you go into the menu here, you scroll down to control input 1 or 2, you can set it to either CV or you can set it to expression pedal. It's very straightforward. And then you go into the kit menu and when you're in the kit menu, you have the options for control input one and control input two. And in control input one, you basically set up a, a performance macro. Now these are these are, are not exactly, exactly the same. Um, for example here, if we go to, to the filter, say, say you want to modulate the filter, you have envelope depth, uh, you have the, uh, let's see here, uh, you have the attack time, the decay, sustain release, frequency, resonance, but you don't have the options here to change what type of filter. And that's something that sets sets this apart from, say, using a performance instead. So a performance macro 
is not exactly the same as the modulation macro using the control inputs. They, these are not exactly the same in, in what you can do with them. But using the control inputs, I think it's something I want to get back to in another video. Uh, otherwise, this video will be like two hours long and I'm not sure you guys <laughs> want that. But check out my other video on the Analog 4 if you want more details on how to use these inputs. Now lastly, I want to do a bit of a comparison to the DigiTac because I know that question will arise. You know, which one should you choose? Especially now since the Rhythm got the sampling that is pretty similar, if not exactly the same as the DigiTac sampling. So the feel of these devices are quite different. Even if they share similar specs, I will go over some of the more important things that sets them apart. Now, both are eight voice drum machines slash groove boxes. However, the Rhythm Mark II has 12 channels, whereas the Digitact has eight. But the Digitact also has the eight MIDI channels, so it all depends on if you need those MIDI channels. So at the surface level, they share a similarity when it comes to the voices, but remember that the Rhythm got 12 tracks plus the FX track. That's kind of a big deal, 12 possible sounds compared to the 8 of the Digitact. And like I said, the Digitact has the 8 MIDI tracks, which makes it ideal as a brain for a hardware setup, and in this regard, it's closer to the Octatrack that also has the 8 MIDI tracks, but the Octatrack has more options for those tracks. The Rhythm lacks these features, and it can't really sequence external gear beside syncing it up and you know sending the clock and transport values. The Digitact also lacks analog synth engine, or any real synth engine, depending on how you look at it. On the Digitact, you can, just as on the Rhythm, use a very short sample, for example, to create a synth sound, but it's not really considered by most people a true synth engine. When it comes to the I.O., the Rhythm wins easily. The Digitact only sports the stereo outputs that are connected to the headphones. This is of course similar to the Rhythm, but the Rhythm have the individual outputs as well. And like I talked about earlier, the sampling is very similar, but on the Rhythm, sample playback will go through the analog circuitry, which will make a slightly different sound. And, and to my ears, samples do sound better on the Rhythm than on the Digitact, just because of how you can process them with the analog engine of the Rhythm. But let's talk about playing synth sounds, using these devices as sort of a synth or groove box. So while creating the synth sounds based on samples is fairly similar, and of course the Rhythm you can create synth sounds using the engines as well, the analog engines, playing them back is quite different. The Digitax chromatic keyboard is to me at least a much more playable option than the pad-based setup on the Rhythm. However, this could be the exact opposite if you, unlike me, actually prefer pads for playing melodies. And speaking about I.O., there is of course no CV capability on the Digitact. So yeah, the Rhythm wins in this department as well. But the Digitact wins in another department, and it's that it has a control all function that the AR lacks. The control all basically means that if you hold the function, or is it the function or the track button? Can't remember at the moment, but you hold the button, and if you tweak, say, the frequency, you change it on all the tracks at once and this can create some really cool cool <laughs> sounds and and transitions and whatnot while i feel that the rhythm has a drawback in the sense that you need to use a double command you have to hold the track button and select the track in order to select that track for editing the digitact you just press the track the rhythm still have the upper hand when it comes to live performances because of the performance macros the cv or, or pedal input macros as well as the scene changes that you can do. This brings it closer to something like the Octatrack, even though I think the Octatrack is stronger in this regard with its little fader slider thingy where you can fade and slide between different scenes. I still feel the Rhythm has the upper hand to the Digitact when it comes to kind of a live setting because the scenes and performances are really interesting and you can do some really cool stuff with them as well.
Now, lastly, I want to talk about the Octatrack. And no, this won't be like a full comparison. I think it's, it's just that I want to address some of the questions that I get. So I'm frequently asked about whether to get the Digitact, the Rhythm or the Octatrack. And unless you truly want an Octatrack as a drum machine, you know, to only use it as a drum machine, there is little reason to compare the Rhythm and the Digitact and Octatrack. So let me shortly break it down for you like this. If you want a more straightforward groove box, the Digitact would be my first choice. If you want the best possible drum machine, the Rhythm is the best. If you want a sampler to sample, edit samples, to work with samples, I would say the Octatrack is the best. If you mainly want a MIDI sequencer, but you don't want all the bells and whistles, go for the Digitact. And if you want an analog synthesizer, obviously go for the Analog 4 or the Analog Keys. That's kind of my rundown. Oh, and maybe if you're into heavy live performances and you want something to, to kind of skip the computer, go for the Octatrack. And last in this video, I just want to talk about my first impressions and answer the question if I think it's worth the money to get the Analog Rhythm Mark II. Now, firstly, is this the best drum machine out there? And I think, yeah, I think it is. Now, of course, it has a has a price tag to match, but I do think it's super versatile. I think you get a nice effects section, you get really nice sequencing, powerful synthesis, powerful sampling engine. And of course, you know, you can always point to products like the MPC Live, the Torres, Dr. Track to be competitors. But I think when you want that analog sound, in combination with a very modern approach to sampling, to sequencing and so on. I think there's just not that many options out there that can compete on this level. Uh, so yeah, I think it's the best drum machine that you can pretty much get at the moment. But it's not the best sampler out there, obviously. Obviously there's a lot of competition in the sampler range. Now is it worth the money though? Because it got quite a hefty price tag. It's in the sell your kidney category. I probably shouldn't make any drug references in this video because then it will get demonetized by YouTube. What you get is an eight voice drum machine. So that's comparable to many other drum machines out there that has say six or more voices. And of course, looking at the price tag, it sounds very expensive. But then again, you have to count in. You have the sampling capability. You have the sample options on the channels as well. So it's basically a dig attack plus something like a drum brute combined and then you also have to think about the fact that you get a good reverb a good delay a master compressor a master distortion unit you have overdrive you have bit reduction on the sample channels and these things cost money if you were to add say a delay reverb and distortion to your drum machine unless you're going for something really budget really cheap i would say that you might want to spend about 200 dollars on each of those that's 600 dollars just on the effect so i think when you start to look at what you're actually paying for it becomes more a question of do i need these features rather than if it's worth the money so if you need the features it's definitely worth the money if you just want a simple drum machine without any added effects without you know a super advanced sequencer without the sampling capability you know there's a ton of good options out there so don't sweat it but if you if you want all these features i don't think you're paying that much for it so yeah that's kind of my thoughts on it guys thank you so much for watching this video if you want to subscribe hit the like button and consider supporting my work here on youtube over on patreon.com with a monthly donation if you want to so thank you so much everybody and i hope you have a pleasant day thank you